this is Let's Talk About Myths, baby. And I am your host, Liv, here with an episode to save my soul. That's a little dramatic, but like, not really. Today, I am here with one of two episodes today and Friday's episode, which will be collections of past episodes, as I am sometimes want to do when I need to survive. And in this time, we are looking at myths from the Bronze Age, or rather myths not from the Bronze Age, but which tell us something about how the cultural memory of the Bronze Age manifested in the later myths. So today we have, actually, now that I say all of that, we have one one bit of the episode is absolutely a myth from the Bronze Age, and that is we are starting out with a little bit of the epic of Gilgamesh. I covered that back, I don't even know when, but over two episodes, uh, and this is just a little taste of those two episodes covering that myth from ancient Iraq. And then we are going to Crete, of course, and looking at the myths of Crete, like Europa and Zeus and the sort of the mythological memory of creating Europe from the Levant, the same people who would go on to help the Greeks invent their alphabet, those Phoenicians. Then, of course, we are moving to the mainland, to the myths of Mycenae and my favorite cursed family... Those tantalids and their horrifying familial relationships. And then, of course, the most famous woman of Sparta, Helen. We're going to look at a little bit of that myth from a past episode. And, of course, um, some of the Iliad. Because who doesn't want to listen to Patroclus, really, and Hector, you know, everyone's favorite characters from the Iliad. These sections from past episodes were picked out by Michaela because she's an absolute gem who wants me to be able to continue to function and thus help me put together a couple of episodes that will allow me to take a little bit of a rest. Uh, If it hasn't been clear in past episodes, I'm really struggling. And while I loved the Bronze Age series so very much, it definitely didn't help the struggle, as it was not remotely in my field of expertise. Uh, but it was a joy, and I'm very glad we did it. In any case, today we are just looking at these past episodes. Um, some of them are from a very long time ago, some not quite so long ago. All of them are from much larger episodes featuring much more of these myths that do tell us something about this cultural memory of the Bronze Age. There is a Spotify playlist listed in the episode's description, and that has all of the original full-length episodes. If you want to keep listening, if you want to return to the whole of the Epic of Gilgamesh or uh, my favorite cursed family, maybe a little bit want to return to the Iliad, the most famous bit of cultural memory. All of that is available in the episode's description if you are so inclined. This is episode 260, Archaic Myths as Cultural Memory of the Bronze Age. Gilgamesh is a king of Uruk, a godly king, part god and part human. It's believed that the story is indeed based on a real king, though I suppose we have to assume that king was all human. You never know, though, the Mesopotamians were far more advanced. Perhaps they did have a god king, too. Gilgamesh, king of Uruk, is said to be blessed. He's in the style of Heracles. He's strong, wise, beautiful. He's everything you want a king to be and more. He's also a dick, another standard king trait, I would argue. Gilgamesh is becoming tyrannical, and his people are attempting to rise up against him in whatever way they can. Gilgamesh is oppressive. He's forcing the men to take part in games of strength, of forced labor, it's not entirely clear which, but they're being oppressed and forced into something. 
And the women, well, as per mythology, Gilgamesh is forcing all the women to have sex with him, usually on their wedding nights, before they have sex with their new husband, but after they're married. He's an incredibly classy man, and, and I would say that the Greeks likely found some inspiration in old Gilgamesh when they were developing their own mythologies. There's some similarities there. In answer to these actions by Gilgamesh, the people of Uruk call upon their gods to help them against this tyrannical king. They call to the goddess Aruru, the goddess who created humankind to begin with. They ask her to create something that could stand up to Gilgamesh. As he is two-thirds god, the people themselves don't stand a chance against him. And so Aruru creates a man, a wild man named Enkidu. Much like the creation story of the Greeks, Aruru creates this new man from a lump of clay. Enkidu rivals Gilgamesh in size and strength, but he begins his life living wildly, amongst the animals and not among the other humans of Uruk. Enkidu is discovered by a young man, a trapper. He doesn't live in the city of Uruk, but in the countryside. His livelihood is trapping and hunting animals, but Enkidu is preventing him from doing this. Enkidu releases the trapped animals and keeps them safe from hunters, but the trapper can see from afar that Enkidu is no match for him. He's enormous and so strong, the man doesn't dare approach him himself. The trapper tells all of this to his father, who suggests he go find Gilgamesh in Uruk. Gilgamesh himself is enormous and strong, and so if anyone can stop this wild man from freeing all the animals and causing all this trouble, it's Gilgamesh. So the trapper visits Gilgamesh and Uruk, and the king has a plan. The plan may also have originated with the trapper's father, but a work that's thousands of years old and also translated from a very ancient language and was originally written in verse on clay tablets means following along is sometimes left to the imagination. So Gilgamesh has a plan to lure Enkidu, this mysterious wild man from the forests where he's been causing real trouble for this trapper man. Take Shamhat with you, he tells the trapper. She'll be able to lure this man from the forests. You see, Shamhat is what we would now politely refer to as a sex worker, but as we all know, it's the oldest profession in the world. Get yours, ladies. So Shamhat is the real savior here. Shamhat goes with the trapper back to where he's been seeing Enkidu, and she approaches this enormous, super strong wild man. To entice Enkidu and on the instruction of the trapper, Shamhat legit just strips down to nothing and walks up to him. Like, hi, I'm a naked woman and that's really all you need to know. And it is. She walks up to him, naked, and Enkidu is basically just like, yep, let's do this. And so they have a lot of sex. It's said that Shamhat here does the work of a man. I think that basically just means she takes control of the sex they're having, which really is just refreshing. Would you look at this? A myth where a woman is all, let's have some wild, consensual sex in the forest, you hairy, unwashed wild man. They do this for six days and seven nights. Yeah, six days and seven nights. And not on and off. No, because as it's translated here, <clears throat> Enkidu is erect for six days and seven nights. And after all that, Shamhat very easily convinces Enkidu to return to Uruk with her. She tells him about the gods of the city, Anu and Ishtar, and of Gilgamesh, the big strong king. Enkidu is keen. He's gotten the taste of living amongst humans, and he's down for more of it. I will absolutely come along with you, he tells Shamhat, and I will roll up to the city of Uruk and make very clear that I am stronger and mightier than Gilgamesh, and I'll just mix things up in the city. Keep it fresh. Oh, Shamhat tries to tone down Enkidu's plans here. Nah, Gilgamesh is pretty impressive, she tells him. He's blessed by the gods and you really shouldn't fuck with him. Shamhat wants Enkidu to come back to Uruk with her, but she doesn't want him to die the moment he gets there. Europa was, of course, originally from Phoenicia, where she was a princess, daughter of the king of Tyr, and sister to my beloved hero, Cadmus. 
Like so many victims of Zeus, Europa was minding her business one morning, out picking flowers by the shore with some of her friends and servants. According to the Alexandrian poet Motius, retold by Edith Hamilton, Europa had woken from a dream that she couldn't shake. She dreamt of two continents, each shaped as a woman, possessed by a woman, and they both tried to claim Europa as their own. One, Asia, said she had birthed Europa and so owned her. The other was nameless and told Europa that Zeus would give her to this nameless continent. She was shaken and didn't want to try to sleep again, so she and her friends and servants wandered off to find themselves where they were then when Zeus came, picking flowers by the shore. There he sees her, and he wants her. He will take her. But Zeus is, you know, both creative and utterly horrible, so he comes to Europa as a beautiful, mesmerizing white bull. Apollodorus tells us that its breath smelled of roses, if you want to understand just how appealing Zeus made himself to this young girl. The bull catches Europa's attention right along the seashore, and she climbs aboard its back in an almost trance-like state. In an instant, before Europa could even blink, let alone any of her friends or servants could do anything to stop what was about to happen or to help her at all, Zeus, as this sparkling white bull, leapt into the sea and swims off. He swims and swims across the Mediterranean until he comes upon an island. By the time they reach the island, Europa is well aware that she is not riding on the back of a real bull. It's simply not possible. No, she is certainly on the back of a god in disguise. She isn't stupid. She knows what that means. Women of Greek mythology learned fast on that front. Zeus finally drops Europa on the island of Crete, a large island north of Egypt. He doesn't choose this island randomly, it's quite intentional. Whether it's for love, as this poet retold by Edith Hamilton notes, or simply Zeus's desires, which we all know well of, he brings her to the island on which he was raised, away from Kronos's prying eyes. You see, Zeus was raised on Mount Ida, on Crete, secreted away from his father, who was, you know, in the habit of eating his children. Another of my favorite stories, obviously. He brings her there to found a dynasty on the island, and in order to do that, as is Zeus's constant and horrific way, he rapes her. This poet would have you believe it's romantic. I beg to differ. The Minoans, the term Minoans came from this ancient king, King Minos, and he was mythologically the son of Zeus and Europa. Zeus and Europa had three sons, and Minos was kind of in competition with his two brothers on who would be the king of Crete. I guess Minos did officially ascend the throne, but his brothers were basically like, hell no, and they tried to take it from him. You know how brothers can be always stealing kingships. Minos decides that in order to defeat his brothers, or I guess just sort of, he is already king, so we basically just get rid of his brothers? I don't know. He's against them in some way. And he asks Poseidon for help in defeating his brothers in whatever way he needs to. Poseidon is, of course, the god of the sea. He's also the god of horses, but don't ask me why. Anyway, Minos asks Poseidon for help. He prays to Poseidon, asking him to send a snow-white bull as a show of support. That's right, another bull. A white bull is, of course, how his father seduced his mother, which I think makes this a hint creepier. So Minos asks for this bull, and Poseidon is a nice guy, and he sends it to him, along with a show of support for the king. Or I guess this bull kind of is the show of support. So now there's this fancy white bull hanging around Knossos. Minos is then expected to kill the bull to show that he's honoring Poseidon for this super pointless and pretty creepy gift. Needless animal death if I've ever seen one. But, spoilies, Minos doesn't kill the bull. He thinks it's just too damn pretty. He's a sucker for a beautiful bull. I think it runs in the family. Poseidon is not psyched by this pretty obvious betrayal, 
And he's basically like, well, fuck you then, Minos. I'm going to totally fuck up your life now. And he does a little godly magic. And he makes Minos' wife, Pasiphae, fall truly, madly, deeply in love with this bull. And godly magic is potent as fuck, my friends, because boy does she fall in love. Meanwhile, in the lives of people not in love with bulls, Minos also has his own personal inventor. This is a fellow by the name of Daedalus, and he lives on the island of Crete with his son Icarus. Daedalus is awesome. He's basically the king of fucking crazy incredible inventions. So Daedalus, this resident inventor, is called to see Pasiphae. See, she's been hanging out with her new love lately, this white bull, and she's been feeling kind of frustrated. See, as much as she is truly madly deeply in love with this rando animal, the animal just doesn't seem to be into her. Unrequited love. She's pretty worked up about it. You know, she's feeling forlorn, melancholy. She's walking around the palace just huffing in sadness and, frankly, in sexual frustration. Finally, she turns to Daedalus. He's called in to see her, and she asks him for a simple, totally normal, and not at all creepy invention. She wants him to make her a wooden cow. Yes, a hollow wooden cow. Do you see where I'm going with this? Because I will tell you where I'm going with this. Pasiphae wants Daedalus to make her a hollow wooden cow that she can hide in. Mm Mm-hmm. And boy, does Daedalus deliver. He creates a cow that is realistic enough to convince the bull that it is, indeed, a real cow. The bull is suddenly super interested because, you know, he's into other cows, unlike someone. Or I guess, too much like someone. Where we return to our cursed family, Pelops has been ruling the king of Olympia quite happily for a long time. For a while, he was thinking maybe there isn't really a curse at all. Maybe it's just the ramblings of a guy he threw off a cliff and it won't actually have any effect. Then, one day, he learns from, yes, an oracle, that a son of Pelops should be king of Mycenae. The trouble is, Pelops has two sons, Atreus and Thyestes. On the order of their father and the hope that they will be king, Atreus and Thyestes travel to the city of Mycenae, both expecting to claim the throne. And that's when things go really downhill for the family of Pelops. Hermes, hell-bent on implementing the curse issued by his dying son, sends a shepherd to Mycenae. The shepherd brings with him a golden lamb that he says has apparently been miraculously born that way. According to the Mycenaeans, the lamb is an obvious sign of the kingship of the region for some reason. Gold, livestock, guys, watch out for it. It means you're going to be the ruler of the land. Atreus quickly claims that he is the rightful ruler of Mycenae because the shepherd has given him the golden lamb personally. Obviously, he says that's what it meant. Obviously. Atreus, entirely certain that he is now meant to be king, begins preparing for the coronation. Golden lamb, after all. But his brother, Thyestes, isn't giving up so easily. Thyestes seduces Arope, Atreus' wife. He convinces her to give him the golden lamb. And so when all the important people of the region get together for the ceremony to choose their new king... It's Thyestes that rolls up with the golden lamb, not Atreus. And so it's Thyestes that is crowned king of Mycenae. (gasps) Dun dun dun. But it isn't over yet. Because this is Greek mythology and it's called the curse on the house of Atreus and not Pelops for a reason. See, Zeus wants Atreus to be the king of Mycenae. He doesn't much care for Thyestes, though I'm not sure why. 
So Zeus, now working to make Atreus the king, causes the sun to move in the wrong direction. This, as you might imagine, causes people down on Earth to freak out a little bit. I mean, big, very high-profile change in the way the world operates. Anyway, they were worked up. Continuing on with his plan, Zeus sends Hermes to whisper in Atreus' ear. Following Hermes' instructions, Atreus then tells the people of Mycenae that the rightful king will be shown by a sign from the gods that's much more impressive than some weirdly golden animal. And with that, Zeus causes the sun to return to its rightful route through the sky. The people are, of course, relieved by this development. They also recognize that this is obviously what was meant by that earlier foretelling. And obviously that means that Atreus should in fact be king of Mycenae. Obviously. It's all very obvious. So Atreus becomes king. But the madness isn't over yet. Thyestes is banished from the kingdom for what he's done, seducing Atreus' wife and stealing the precious golden livestock. Bad news. Atreus is, of course, angry with his brother and his wife. Shit has gone down. And so the immediate obvious thing to do is to drown his wife, Aerope. You know, as you do when you're mad. Best solution. Murder. But that's not enough. Atreus is still pissed. Becoming king is apparently all he cares about in the world because he's really willing to fuck shit up because his brother and wife had, you know, prevented him from being king. He sounds like a real great guy. Atreus tells his brother that he's been forgiven, so Thyestes returns to Mycenae thinking it's all good. No news on whether it's a red flag to Thyestes that Aerope has been drowned, but all the same, Atreus invites Thyestes to a reconciliation celebration. Feast in honor of these brothers burying the hatchet. How sweet, right? For dinner, Atreus kills Thyestes' sons, cuts them up, cooks them, and feeds them to his brother. There's a really pleasant theme in this family. Now, we all remember how the gods feel about cannibalism, particularly when it's a family member. Big, big no-no. Thankfully, a no-no in most polite societies, but the gods particularly found this to be the worst of the worst. We're told that the sky darkens as Atreus commits this crime, that the sun hides from the sight. Thyestes is feeling particularly famished, and he eats the food happily, filling himself right up. Finally, he wonders aloud, hmm, where are my sons? Atreus then lifts the lid on a serving dish that has gone unnoticed. In it were Thyestes' sons hands, and feet, and heads. Thyestes leaps from the table, losing his damn mind. He yells a curse at Atreus, asking that his house may fall. So, we all know that Helen eventually goes with Paris, whether she likes it or not. As you'll hear in this Friday's reading episode, and as you all well know, this is because of the judgment of Paris, the silly contest between Athena, Aphrodite, and Hera, about who is the loveliest, a contest that is adjudicated by Paris for some reason. But does Helen go with Paris willingly, or is she taken? That is the age-old question of the Trojan War. How much say did she actually have? Of course, regardless, I don't think anyone could have guessed that it would spawn quite the war that it did, so I'm not placing any blame here, but the question of her agency in the matter is deeply fascinating and deeply up for debate. So let's dive into what we do and do not know about Paris and Helen's departure from Sparta. First, according to most tellings of it, Menelaus was away at the time. He was called off to some business on Crete, leaving the pair alone. Of course, not actually alone. They would have had loads of other people in the Spartan house, both free and enslaved, but Helen was left to be the head of the house, in whatever way women were allowed. And thus, she was the person determining the Xenia of it all. Remember, Xenia is the rule of hospitality that was vital in the ancient Greek world, particularly in stories from their mythology. 
Everything comes down to Xenia, whether the guest was a good guest and the host was a good host. It's very much a give and take relationship, but when you fuck it up, you're in real trouble. Paris, just by visiting Sparta with this secret desire to run off with Helen, is breaking Xenia, though no one knows it until the truth comes out. And not only is he about to spit in the face of his hosts by running off with Helen, but they also steal a huge amount of Spartan treasure. One thing I noticed when researching this is often Helen is described in the Iliad alongside the wealth of Menelaus as though she is part of that wealth, but also that there is a hell of a lot of gold and other treasure that is at stake, in addition to a wife. The two go off while Menelaus is away, taking with them so much of the Spartan treasure, and they sail off into the sunset. I mean, we don't know what time of day it was, but it certainly sounds better if they're sailing off into the sunset. Off they go, no matter the time of day, stopping en route on an island where, we are told, they have sex. Again, consensual? Tough to say. It's not clear one way or the other, but like so many instances like these, that could very well just be because the men writing the stories down, or telling them in songs, didn't much care how the women felt. The purpose was to explain the origins of the war, to exemplify Helen and Paris' betrayal of Menelaus. Some say they went straight to Troy, others that they wandered around Phoenicia for a while, still more that suggests that in the time it took them to reach Troy, Helen had already given birth to a child of Paris's. That would certainly be a long wander. No one seems quite certain how long it took, but it seems to me the most logical timeline is a fairly quick arrival in Troy with no child of the two. But still, we're asking the big question. Did Helen want to go? Did she fall in love with Paris and leave with him happily? Was this some kind of epic love story for the ages? Did Paris convince her to go, that she would have had a better life with him off in Troy? Did Paris seduce her using his handsomeness that seems equal to Helen's beauty, to draw her in in an almost purely sexual encounter? Did that happen? Maybe Helen was willing to have sex with him before realizing that this meant she would have to leave with him because if anyone in Sparta found out, she'd be well and truly fucked? Or was it a straight-up abduction, a story of a horrible kidnapping and eventual assault by Paris? Like so much of Greek myth, it really depends on who you ask. In most of the very oldest sources on this topic, the question of why any of this happened typically comes down to, simply, divine intervention. Paris picked Aphrodite in the judgment of Paris, and that was the end of it. She promised him the most beautiful woman in the world, and she followed through. According to the work called The Cypris or The Cypria, which is one of the lost epics surrounding the story of the Trojan War, It was as simple as that. Aphrodite brought the two together, and off they went. The Cypris, though lost, is talked about enough that we know that it's basically about the origins of the Trojan War. It's named for Aphrodite, the Cyprian goddess. Meanwhile, in the Iliad itself, it remains pretty vague, with Helen only lamenting that it ever happened at all, rather than much of anything about her own choices in the matter. There's a moment where she's speaking with the Trojans, particularly Priam, and they're looking down upon the battlefield, taking note of the Greeks laying siege. Priam asks her to speak of her old husband, Menelaus, and asks her to tell him about the other Greeks that are assembled there. To which Helen replies, quote, Sir, father of my husband, dear and reverend in my eyes, would that I had chosen death rather than to have come here with your son, far from my bridal chamber, my friends, my darling daughter, and all the companions of my girlhood. But it was not to be, and my lot is one of tears and sorrow. As much as Helen's phrasing here could suggest that she's taking some kind of accountability, it's actually in direct response to Priam telling her that he knows it isn't her fault, that none of this is her fault, and that the gods are to blame. Meanwhile, the Greeks during and after the war do love to blame Helen. 
So what about the idea that Paris took her quite literally by force? A violent abduction that would then ultimately lead to a violent assault. That, too, is never really explicit. The idea of that kind of encounter has certainly emerged, but it didn't necessarily exist in the ancient world, or at least in the ancient sources that we have. Okay, what about Helen leaving quite willingly, happily, by her own explicit choice? That, in fact, does exist in at least one fragmentary source that survives. It's a fragment attributed to Alcaeus, but I'm reading it quoted in Bettany Hughes's book on Helen. It's noted in the episode's description. So the fragment of this poem goes, quote, And fluttered the heart of Argive Helen in her breast, maddened with passion for the man from Troy, the traitor guest. She followed him over the sea in his ship, leaving her child at home and her husband's richly covered bed, her heart persuaded by desire. This is a notable fragment, but to me, it sounds a lot more like the blame that we hear placed on Helen in the plays, like Aeschylus's Agamemnon, or even just in the references to her by the Greeks in the Iliad, who are always going on about how much better a husband Menelaus was. This idea that she just up and left her husband on a whim because a hot guy rolled into town. These suggestions are certainly meant to place more blame on her, but they can also obviously be read as simply a woman doing what she wanted. If you imagine Helen's marriage to Menelaus to be less than ideal, to not have any love in it at all, then why wouldn't she want to leave her home with this stranger, this beautiful man from the East who's come professing his love? Could she have foreseen a war that brought all the Greeks together against Troy? Certainly not, because the idea of all the Greeks coming together to do something like this was unheard of. It's part of what makes the Iliad notable in the first place. This idea that Helen went quite willingly and sometimes quite maliciously gets taken up by later poets, too. Apollodorus describes her as quite callously leaving behind her much better husband and child. And of course, then there's Ovid. His heroities include a letter from Paris to Helen and a letter from Helen to Paris. I won't say too much about these because you just know I'm reading them to you on Friday's episode. Whew, but Ovid certainly takes his idea of Helen to another level. Yes, he makes her leave willingly, but he does add a bit more depth to it and a bit more humming and hawing and calling out Paris for his failure to adhere to Xenia, to his insult on Menelaus for even showing up there in the first place. But, well, honestly, the letter from Paris to Helen is the one that's the really good stuff. It's, it's truly something else. You're going to love it. So sure, we do have all these varying notions on why Helen left and just how much agency she had or didn't have. But if we're sticking to the sources from those earliest days, those that surround the Iliad and the Odyssey and those works themselves, the main answer for all of this mess is, quite simply, the gods. It's all Aphrodite's fault. Because regardless of anything else, Aphrodite controls love. One could really blame Aphrodite for any messes that they make when it comes to love, but in this case we have explicit evidence that Aphrodite instructed Paris to go take Helen, that she may have even made him love her, and that she at least in part convinced Helen to go with him. She may not have made Helen outright love Paris, but she certainly made her go with him. Patroclus, disguised as Achilles and the Myrmidons, swarm the battlefield, startling everyone there. No one thought they'd see Achilles fighting in this battle. It's been too long and there's been too much death already. But now the Trojans spot Achilles' shining armor as he rages towards them on his chariot, Myrmidon streaming behind him. The Trojans are terrified. They realize that Achilles must have finally let go of his anger, probably because of how close they've gotten to the Greek ships, having set one on fire just moments before Achilles came after them. They look around wildly, hoping to find some means of escaping. Patroclus himself is full of energy, appearing as he is in Achilles' armor. It makes him feel powerful, like he can do anything Achilles can. He throws his spear and it draws blood. He kills 
countless Trojans in his wake as he thunders through the battlefield. Killing so many in his path, Patroclus finally reaches the gates of Troy with the Myrmidons. But the gods can't let him get that close, and Apollo appears, hell-bent on ending Patroclus' life before he can defeat the Trojans. First, he yells down to him, telling Patroclus that he isn't fated to defeat the Trojans now. He should turn back. The Trojans must fall to a greater man than he. Hearing this, Patroclus hesitates a little. Apollo, meanwhile, now goes to Hector. He transforms himself into a powerful man known to Hector, and he riles him up, telling him to go straight at Patroclus. Hector's motivated by this, and he brings all his men with him as he goes at Patroclus, ignoring all other Greeks in his path. He knows who he wants to kill, and he doesn't much care if others escape in the process. Patroclus sees Hector coming, and he throws his spear. But it doesn't hit Hector. It misses him and instead hits another Trojan with him. It hits him between the eyes, shattering his skull and sending his eyeballs flying. Patroclus continues charging at the Trojans, killing more men every time. He's full of adrenaline, and the success he's had so far is bolstering him. Still, he feels as powerful as Achilles. The armor is giving him confidence. He knows the power of Achilles, his closest friend and likely his boyfriend, and he knows how powerful he too is in the armor alone. For hours, he and the Myrmidons continue their success against the Trojans, killing countless men as they go. But as the sun begins to set, and Patroclus charges at the Trojans once more, the narration of the Iliad switches. Now the narrator directs everything as if he's speaking to Patroclus himself. It has the effect of dramatizing the forthcoming events far more than before. It's powerful. We're speaking directly to Patroclus as everything begins to crumble around him. Apollo meets you on the battlefield, covering himself in a mist so that he's unseen by you. He appears and knocks off the glittering helmet of Achilles that you're wearing. It falls to the ground, now covered in blood and dirt. Zeus gives the helmet to Hector to wear, signaling even more trouble for you as the gods gang up against you. Now, your spear shatters in your hand and your shield falls from your shoulders. Apollo comes up and unfastens your breastplate, letting it fall to the ground and exposing your bare flesh. From behind, you're stabbed by a Trojan in the shoulder. You're wounded, but you survive. You're now without armor and stabbed in the shoulder, and you try to retreat. You try to flee to get away, but you know the end is coming. And Hector sees you too. Hector charges at you, and he drives his spear into your stomach, pushing it all the way through into the other side. You fall to your knees, clutching your belly where the spear is driven through. Hector stands over you as you die, telling you it's too bad. Not even your precious Achilles can save you now. He tells you that Achilles must have given you orders to not come back until you've wounded Hector. Of course, you know this isn't true. You know you went farther than Achilles ever wanted you to. Achilles wanted you to drive the Trojans away from the ships. Nothing further. He didn't want you going at Hector. Achilles knew it wouldn't go well. But you didn't listen to Achilles, though. You just wanted it all to end. You wanted an end to the violence. And as soon as you'd put on Achilles' armor and his helmet, you knew that you were powerful. You wanted to do what you could, and you took it too far. And now, with your dying breath, you tell Hector that he can boast all he wants, but you know the truth. You're only dying now because Zeus and Apollo wanted you to. It's them who made this happen, not Hector. And not only that, you tell him, but death will come for you too, Hector, sooner than you think. So you die in the bloody sand at the feet of Hector. It 
It's Menelaus that first sees that Patroclus has fallen, and he rushes over to him to defend the body. He stands over Patroclus, holding his spear and threatening to kill whoever comes near. But more and more Trojans, led by Hector, come at Menelaus as he tries to defend the fallen Patroclus, and finally he's forced to move away from the body. Quickly, Hector strips Patroclus and takes the remaining armor as well as that that had been removed by the gods. He begins to try to pull Patroclus away. He wants to cut off his head and feed it to the dogs, which is where I begin to dislike Hector a bit more than I had before. It's a bit of overkill, don't you think, Hector? Pun, unfortunately, intended. Ajax, though, sees what Hector is trying to do, and he comes up immediately to protect the body along with Menelaus. He places his shield over Patroclus and stands above it, daring anyone to get closer. Meanwhile, Zeus watches as Hector replaces his own armor with that of Achilles, which he's just stripped off the poor, dead body of beloved Patroclus. Zeus watches Hector and notes that before long, death will reach him too, even though he may be wearing such a powerful man's armor. It was a mistake, Hector, taking that armor and wearing it yourself, one that you'll regret. Thank you all so much for listening. As always, I will be back on Friday with another of these revisiting episodes, but looking at conversations I've had about these myths that have origins in these very real Bronze Age people. So stay tuned for that. And I will be back soon with new episodes. We're going to look at a Euripides play, you guys, because I want to return to my my real roots, my love of loves, just so that I can really get back into it. I am... I'm looking forward to that. Who doesn't love a good visit with Euripides? Uh, <laughs> Let's Talk About Myths Baby is written and produced by me, Liv Albert. Michaela Smith is the Hermes to my Olympians, the assistant producer who put together all of these clips for you because she is an absolute star. Laura Smith is the production assistant and audio engineer who works on so many of the conversation episodes and is creating something really great about the website check it out now. We have opened up some new pages, listing episodes, going into a bit more detail, just kind of laying things out because I have over 500 episodes and it turns out it's like really hard to figure out what to listen to when there's that many. So we're trying to help. Select music in this episode was by Luke Chaos. The podcast is part of the iHeart Podcast Network. Listen on Spotify or Apple or wherever you get your podcasts. And I am Liv and I, I do love this shit.